Well, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning to, to folks in, in the United States and, and uh, good afternoon and good evening to uh, everyone else around the world. Uh, I, my name is Sam DuPont. I am the deputy director of GMF Digital. Uh, GMF Digital is a program of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, uh, and we are dedicated to advancing forward-looking policies to support democracy in the digital age. Uh, we are very excited today uh, for this discussion on the promise and pitfalls of contact tracing apps. Uh, and before we begin, just two notes of housekeeping. First, uh, I encourage you to keep up with this conversation and all of our future work on Twitter uh, at GMF Digital. And secondly, uh, in the, the latter half of the hour, uh, we will be taking questions from all of you. Uh, and so I encourage you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen uh, to ask questions and I will uh, do my best to, to weave them into the conversation. So around the world, uh, governments have been rolling out mobile apps to support contact tracing efforts uh, to, support, to uh, suppress the coronavirus. There has been uh, a great deal of interest and excitement that these apps might help us identify who has been exposed to the virus and thus contain its spread. Um, but these apps also raise a host of questions and challenges related to the privacy of personal information, related to uh, equity and, and the efficacy of the apps, um, and, and related to the, the technology itself. We are very lucky today to have three distinguished panelists uh, here with us to discuss all of these challenges and more. Uh, and I will uh, introduce them briefly now. Uh, hopefully uh, everyone has seen their, their longer bios online. Uh, Thomas Jarzombeck is a member of the German Bundestag uh, and he is a uh, commissioner for digital industry and startups in the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. Uh, he has been one of the driving forces behind Germany's national contact tracing app, uh, Corona Warn app. Dr. Louise Ivers is the executive director at the Center for Global Health at Mass General Hospital uh, and is associate Pre professor of both medicine and global health at Harvard Medical School. Uh, she has been a senior advisor to the team at MIT uh, developing the PACT protocol. And then we have Danny Weitzner, who is principal research scientist at the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, as well as founding director of the MIT Internet Policy Research Initiative. Uh, Danny has been one of the principal investigators behind the PATH check, uh, excuse me, behind the PACT protocol, and is a GMF senior fellow as well. Um, so I'd like to begin the conversation with uh, a by turning to Louise, um, you know, since the coronavirus outbreak uh, earlier this year, we have all become uh, public health experts of one kind or another, but we're very glad to have an actual public health expert here uh, <laughs> to set us straight on uh, some of the ideas and some of the terminology that has uh, infiltrated our everyday conversations. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping you can level set for us at the beginning of this conversation and explain what, what does a testing and tracing regime look like? What is contact tracing and how can an app or other digital technologies potentially support those efforts? Yeah, um, I won't make any comment on the fact that people have become public health experts, but it is, I, I really appreciate being here. Um, contact tracing is new terminology for a lot of people, but it is not new in public health. Um, there are many um, diseases that traditionally are approached through contact tracing. Um, typically though, they have been more slow moving and much less impactful globally uh, epidemics and pandemics. The basic principle about contact tracing is, I think of it as having two kind of functions. One is very much a mathematical function and epidemiological function. You want to try to interrupt transmission chains. So you find an index case, so a person who tests positive for the disease, in this case, COVID-19, and then public health authorities investigate that case. Usually that's on the phone now, for other diseases it might be in person, and you find out where has that person been, who have they been in contact with, and the idea is that you create a list of contacts. The contacts 
are people who have been exposed or potentially exposed to the illness. And what you want to do in the situation of COVID-19 is take those people out of circulation, so to speak, so that they don't infect other people and try to interrupt the transmission chain by that, that way. At the moment, that means because we don't have treatments really that work for asymptomatic people or mildly symptomatic people, that what that means is putting people into quarantine or isolation uh, so that they don't infect others. Um, you know, the other role of contact tracing though that I think is a little bit less discussed is that it's traditionally also an investigative tool a lot of what we understand about how the transmission of disease works and how transmission of the SARS uh, CoV-2 virus has happened is through these investigations. Because initially we just don't really know how everything is transmitted. And when we look at the SARS-1, the first SARS, a lot of the transmission dynamics was understood through contact tracing. And I think in the US, what we're also seeing is a dialogue about the human interaction of contact tracing. So it is not very easy to quarantine for 14 days. Um, this is especially true if you need support, you may need a place to stay, you might need food support, you might need income support. And so the human interaction side of contact tracing is very important. But not to belabor, because I could probably talk for the whole hour about this, which I'm, is not the purpose, so I won't. I think what's very important is that in order to interrupt the change, chains of transmission, for a virus that can be transmitted when the person has no symptoms, you have to be fast in contact tracing. So you have to be fast and have a completeness that contributes to reducing that exponential spread. And this is where I think the promise of technology and digital apps comes in, because the human piece, we know it works, but how to do that at a speed and a scale that will really help to quash and contain outbreaks is a challenge that we've been seeing. We're seeing it in the US, we've seen it in other places. So I think where technology can contribute is really potentially here in adding to the speed and adding to the scope and allowing us to do contact tracing at a scale that may be very challenging to do on a human level. And maybe the last point I'll make before I move on is that every country and every jurisdiction that has been successful in containing so far COVID and the first waves has had excellent contact tracing. Testing, tracing and isolating is an absolutely fundamental part of disease containment. And, you know, it's, it's part of a system. There's other pieces of the system that have to work as well. But it's absolutely fundamentally important that we get this right. And I know we'll hear what's been happening in Germany, and that has been a key point early in the outbreak in Germany as well, to, to be contained through contact tracing. Thank you. That is, I think, a very helpful foundation for this conversation. Um, and I will maybe uh, take your cue and, and segue to, to Thomas. Um, Germany's response to the, the coronavirus has, I think, generally been seen as, as relatively successful. Um, and uh, in addition to all of the other efforts that the, the German government has, has undertaken, uh, a little more than a month ago, Germany rolled out its national contact tracing app. Uh, and you have, of course, been uh, very much involved in that effort. Um, there was initially uh, a great deal of success around getting people to download the app. I think you had uh, over 6 million downloads in the first 24 hours and, and more in the, in the subsequent week. Uh, and so I'm very interested to hear from you how it's going. Uh, one month later, um, what, what are the numbers and, and what are the, uh, how effective has the app been to date? Yes, thanks for the possibility here to talk about our uh, contact tracing app. And yes, I believe it's a very challenging situation around COVID-19 and um, hopefully we have done our job well. But to be honest, we also could learn uh, from the things that happened in, in Italy and in Austria. And um, it's, it's very important um, at, uh, to convince uh, the population that the measures that the government wants to do are the right ones and therefore we had also a, a good a good uh, environment on that and uh, to look at the app it was clear at the beginning we want to do an app it was also clear that uh, privacy is a very important thing in germany 
that we want to have a really privacy friendly application. And the first that we did uh, was um, the idea of building this on a centralized server. And the reason was to learn more about uh, the relationships between uh, infections and uh, uh, meeting people. And uh, it's obvious that it is easier um, to reflect the results of your app and of the algorithms if you can really see who was interacting with whom for what period of time, for what kind of distance. But nevertheless, there was a very strong debate about this topic. And uh, so it was obvious that for the German population, it was important not to have a centralized, but to have a decentralized app. And it was also clear from the beginning that we will not take GPS positions. Uh, uh, instead, we will take uh, Bluetooth codes and to uh, pseudonymize, no, pseudonymize these, these codes so that you don't know who are really the persons that you've met, only to have these numbers there and that a machine in the background can arrange uh, to find out if somebody was infected on that. And um, therefore, so we made uh, uh, this app on the, on the Bluetooth uh, uh, and on a decentralized platform. For us, it was necessary to have APIs by uh, Google and by Apple. We found out pretty early that uh, building an app without the support of the uh, vendors of the uh, operating systems, it, it wouldn't work really well. And what we hear is that if you want to do this without the Google and the Apple um, API, it's for instance necessary that your mobile phone is, is switched on and the display is working all the time. And I guess nobody will take its mobile phone in the pocket uh, when the display is on and uh, battery is going to be very, very uh, early empty and and therefore um, it took a little bit of time so that the APIs of Google and App, uh, Apple are ready and uh, we took a consortium uh, out of big German players like Deutsche Telekom and SAP. On the other side there were also some startups going along. They, they were very pushy and said we have an app and we are very best in user experience and we want to make the user interface and so we uh, made uh, this coalition and the startups were very, very helpful to make an attractive app. And um, right now, as you said, in the, first, uh, in the first 24 hours, we had millions of downloads. Right now we have, um, so it's looking, uh, right now we have uh, 16 million downloads. That maybe is not that much as we would like to, to see. But on the other hand, you have to see that on all the smartphones, there are not these APIs. And so it's impossible to, to make this app on all the smartphones. This was a debate. Can, can you arrange also for the ones with the older phones uh, an app? But uh, to be honest, this is not in our hands. This is in, uh, so uh, in, in the end, the capabilities of the old phones uh, uh, have an end. And also it's a question about the operating systems. And then we found out that uh, as in every app, we also had some bugs on some mobile phones like on Samsung there's a power management included that's not typical for Android and that deactivated uh, not not uh, the contact tracing of this app but it deactivated um, uh, the synchronize, uh, synchronization with the server and uh, so we have updates right now in the field and there are still some minor problems but I, I think you know this from every uh, other app and so in the end I believe it's, it's an important part uh, in our strategy fighting against COVID-19. Great, thank you. So I, I, I think you, in your remarks, Thomas, raised a number of these technical and, and policy considerations that uh, the, the, the people behind all of these apps are, are considering. And so I'd like to turn to Danny, um, who, was one of the, the leaders behind the development of the, the PACT protocol. Um, so Danny, the, the different protocols and the different apps that are out there have, have taken a range of different technical approaches. Um, and, and I think those different technical approaches reflect different policy considerations. Um, privacy may be chief, chief among those, those considerations, but, but others as well. Um, and so as you led the development of this, this protocol, what were the, the key decisions you had to make and, and how, were they, how were those choices informed by the various policy considerations that, that you confronted? So 
Sorry, you're still on mute. There we go. Thank you, Sam. And um, thanks to GMF. It's great to be with uh, Louise and Tomas. Uh, very nice to meet you. Um, uh, so it's sort of a fascinating moment in technology development um, uh, as the COVID crisis, uh, you know, gripped the world very suddenly uh, this winter in the Northern Hemisphere, that is, um, uh, March, February, March. Um, uh, it was uh, clear, I think, to a number of people in the technology community uh, that there were there was an urgent need to do contact tracing for all the reasons that that Louise described, um, and a thought that um, we might be able to facilitate that process because such a large proportion of people around the world carry around some kind of smartphone with them, uh, and that that could be used as a sensor. What what we saw at MIT, and and I should say we were, you know, from the very beginning, uh, in touch with with colleagues in Switzerland, in Germany, in the UK, and Singapore, really, really all over the world. Um, uh, a lot of us looked at at, at this challenge, uh, and were very much aware of the strategies uh, used, uh, mostly in Asia, in in China, in uh, Taiwan, in South Korea, uh, with. Uh, quite effective, uh, comprehensive contact tracing strategies and some role for uh, uh, location-based surveillance. So use of GPS or other kinds of location information from cell phone networks. Um, we still don't know um, exactly what that information contributed to the overall, the success of the overall contact tracing effort, but we do know that those efforts were successful, were effective. Um, uh, uh, we also, uh, uh, in, in the PACT group at MIT, uh, felt that the more intrusive uh, location-based approach was not gonna be uh, appropriate uh, in the United States or in other, in other Western democracies. Uh, we also frankly had some doubts about its technical uh, accuracy. Um, uh, so in putting together the, the design of this, of this protocol, um, uh, which really, which preceded uh, the work from from Apple and Google, um, I'd say we we had basically three design considerations that had policy impact. Uh, number one was obviously privacy, so we chose an approach that was based on proximity, not location, as Thomas said. Um, and what that means is that we weren't interested in tracking where people were; we were only interested in determining who was in close proximity to whom, because that's what we learned from public health experts like Dr. Ivers was important. It didn't matter to know where people have been. It only mattered to know when they had been in, in contact with someone who might be effective. We also, uh, again, learning from the history of, of contact tracing, realized that, that confidentiality um, as between individuals was, was a key consideration for us. That is, we, if, if we wanted people to participate in the system, we did not want them to have to do that at the price of revealing their infection status or even revealing the fact that they'd been in, in, in contact with someone who'd been infected to others. Uh, uh, um, uh, so conf patient confidentiality was key. And, and I would say a certain amount of confidentiality as to the public health authorities was also key. And Thomas mentioned that there, have, there are designs that uh, give more information to centralized authorities. We, we decided that given the um, really uncertain nature of a lot of this technology, the unfamiliarity of it, both to individuals and frankly to public health authorities, that the right thing to do was to be as privacy protective as possible, even if that meant that public health authorities might have a little less information that they might like. We felt it was better to have broader participation and a little less information rather than the other way around. Because we, we knew these systems would ultimately be voluntary. Uh, even if there are legal requirements to use the system, people could turn their phones off, wrap them in aluminum foil, whatever. We wanted to avoid that. So privacy is obviously a key requirement. The second requirement is flexibility in design. As Thomas mentioned, uh, uh, the, this underlying contact tracing uh, uh, proximity detection protocol has now been implemented globally by, by Apple and Google in what I should say is an unprecedented 
uh, moment of cooperation between two uh, uh, rivals. Um, this system, everyone should realize, only is going to work effectively if it's uh, uh, if the same system is implemented on both uh, um, Apple and Google devices, because you need to know whether you're in proximity with anyone who's infected, not just whether you're in proximity with someone who has the same kind of phone you have, uh, right, who's infected. So, so we needed to see that kind of cooperation. Uh, we also felt it was very important that individual public health authorities, whether they be at the national level, as in the, is the case in some countries, or at the state level, as in the, is the case in Europe, that individual authorities be able to be in control of the design of these services so that they would be culturally appropriate uh, so that they would uh, reflect whatever the, the, the local disease control strategy was of the public health authority. And probably most importantly, so that um, individuals would have confidence that the app they were using was one that was designed and vouched for by their public health authority, not by some unknown um, uh, uh, technology company, large or small. Final thing about, about the design of, the, of these protocols has been, as, as Louise said at the beginning, um, making sure that from a public health perspective, we could have rapid notification of individuals as soon as someone was infected, number one, and the best integration possible with the existing and essential manual contact tracing process. So I, I think for a while, um, people, including in our group, tended to think of these systems as separate, that there was a, uh, uh, an automated system that was operating in one place and then a separate manual contact tracing system. We very quickly realized that those had to be as well integrated uh, as possible. Um, uh, and, and probably most importantly, and I'll, and I'll end on this, I think that what we know is that effective control of this particular disease requires the most rapid possible notification of people uh, who come into contact with those who are infected so that those individuals can take steps to isolate themselves, uh, to go get tested themselves, whatever is the appropriate uh, uh, public health response. But it has to happen quickly. Um, and recent research, recent modeling is showing that probably the most important thing uh, in connection with this automated notification system or any kind of contact tracing system is the ability to get rapid return on test results. In the US, I think we're frankly failing on that. Uh, I think other countries have done much better and we should really be working on, on learning from them about how to do that uh, quickly. Thanks, Danny. So Louise, coming back to you, both, both Danny and Thomas have talked about a certain tension between uh, the, the desire to protect privacy on the one hand and the desire to uh, gather information and do the, the kind of investigation that, that you talked about in your opening remarks. The, uh, you noted that there's often a great deal of value that can be extracted from the kind of information that officials are, are able to glean through contact tracing. Uh, and it seems to me that one of the, a, a, an, an element at the core of, of this, this tension is, is trust and how much trust individuals can have in the, uh, the, the, the technical aspects of the, the app, as well as the, uh, the government that may be implementing uh, the, the contact tracing protocols. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious how you have seen, as you've watched governments around the world um, undertake their, their own contact tracing efforts and roll out their own different digital approaches to enhancing those efforts. Um, how, how has trust played a role in the, the effectiveness of those efforts? Um, and, and is there a, a regional component to that? Is, and is, is, it a, is it a particular barrier that you see in the United States? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, all outbreaks have local implications and the local ability to respond is very important and every context is very different. Um, you know, pandemics are not just infectious situations, they're human, they're human. And the social context and the public health context, context 
is really important. And, and you know, maybe to make a precision on the discussions that Danny and I have had and others at MIT about GPS location. I mean, I think exactly the where a person was is probably not important, but, you know, in some situations, the where is important in terms, especially of identifying um, clusters of outbreaks, which is one of the challenges for the current totally decentralized system that Apple and Google allows, is that you cannot link you cannot link exposures so you wouldn't know from public health perspective if someone has exposed potentially 100 people or just two people we don't get that information and i'll mention this to get back to your question of trust you know in observing and trying to learn the and from the south korean response you know they had a very bad outbreak of mers in 2015 and they had more than 17,000 cases and they had 38 deaths and this, this actually prompted them to enact a number of public health laws that gave them the authority then when the COVID pandemic began to really access information um, for public health that the community was more willing to give and to share in the, in the interest of public health. So I think if you look at the US, I mean, the US response has been a complete fiasco from my perspective. And so it's hard to have people trust in one piece of it when they're just not able to see a trust in the whole part of it. So when I observe again, reading about the German response, you can see very early on, you know, a quick, you know, very quick testing capability, very quick attempt to break clusters. And presumably, I mean, the future research will show us that the public in Germany were able to see many pieces of the response and then be able to say, well, we're trusting in this approach. So I think, you know, what I see as a, and I've worked in a lot of um, outbreak responses, uh, HIV, TB, Zika, um, cholera, many of my colleagues worked in the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And public trust is really critical piece of pandemic response. But it's not just as simple as saying, do they trust in the app? You know, the trust in the app is part of trusting in a system. We certainly in the US have had a very disparate impact of the outbreak. We have a huge impact in black communities and Latinx communities. We have a very anti-immigrant uh, administration that has really been pressurizing um, immigrants that's been pushing out asylum seekers and communities that are most at risk uh, of actually acquiring the infection are potentially the least trustful of the system for good reason, uh, in my opinion. So I think, you know, where, I where we try to learn the lessons, it's very difficult in looking at different countries to say, well, which piece really contributed what amount to their containment? But it's certainly clear that you have to have integrated approaches you have to have uh, very strong science communications because the messages are complicated and nuanced. And we have certainly not had that here in the US. We have people arguing with each other over things that are not important and not really getting good science communications. So, you know, preventing, testing, containing, treating is all part of a spectrum and the trust has to be part of that. So I think in that context, the idea in the US, you know, that you would share your information with, you know, the government, I think is, is particularly concerning for many, many, many folks. And I, I do think there's an irony here, because if you look at the amount of personal information that your average person in the US shares on social media and with companies and leaves their Bluetooth on when they go into a store and then are tracked and ads, it's a little ironic that there, there might be distrust in the public health authorities when we give up so much private information to corporations. Um, but I'm sure there's others on the phone better positioned to talk about that in particular. Well, thanks. Yeah, there, there's a lot in that, that response that I'd love to, to pull on later in the conversation. But maybe right now, I'd, I'd like to put a, a sort of similar version of the same question to Thomas. Uh, and this is, is drawing on a, a question that we've gotten from, from the audience as well. Uh, Heidi Eggert asked, uh, how exactly did the team in Germany position the app uh, to the citizens of Germany to help people 
understand and feel comfortable with it. Um, and I think this goes to the same sorts of questions of, of trust that, that Louise was just discussing. How, is, is there, do you sort of credit the initial success of the app to uh, a, a sort of innate trust in, in government among, among German citizens or were there specific actions that you have, your government has taken uh, in recent months that you think enabled people to, to have that, uh, that confidence? Yes, on the question of trust, I, I totally agree to Louise. Uh, it's right. It's a question uh, of, of trust in the government itself and the measures around COVID-19. And what we did in Germany was from the very beginning to bring scientists uh, to the media that explained that. As, uh, for instance, one medical professor, Drosten, he is uh, very famous right now in uh, in, in Germany, there were artists that made a song for him right now, <laughs> and he's a very popular person. And uh, so he explained every day on TV, so what's going on with COVID and what's the situation for us and what's the problem in some kind of behaviors and so on. And I guess he convinced a lot of people and we had uh, furthermore scientists uh, um, and the chief from our institute, RKI, Professor Wala, or uh, or others and uh, and and you could see a lot of different scientists in the media and I, I guess that helped very much to gain to gain trust and uh, if there is general trust then this general trust will spill over also to this app and what we found out in the end is it's uh, not everybody would like to install this app for several reasons because there are some people that don't have a smartphones other have older smartphones they were the ones who don't understand how to go to the App Store or Play Store and install this app. There were some people who were in general totally scared and said, we don't want any kind of app from anybody on my, on my mobile phone. So it's the way it is. Uh, you cannot force somebody. It was in the beginning clear also to get trust that it's voluntary to install the app. It's voluntary uh, uh, to share your testing results, but you have to qualify your testing results uh, to reduce uh, uh, problems of, of, of uh, false results. So there is a, um, a ton code on every um, uh, official test that you have to enter into the app to qualify yourself as being infected. Um, and in the end, what's uh, pretty important is that uh, we uh, cooperated uh, uh, with all the NGOs who are uh, traditionally very concerned about privacy questions when developing the app. And this is, for instance, the Chaos Computer Club in, in Germany. They're pretty much famous and they are uh, very critical on all uh, activities from the government when it comes to handling with data. It was a completely open source project. It's uh, published on GitHub. All the community can uh, look into the source code. They can debate. Um, also, all these technical issues that, that are being discussed right now are openly discussed on GitHub. And I think this openness uh, is very important. And uh, from my point of view and from government point of view, it's important to do all the projects, all the uh, uh, e-government projects where the government is, is uh, producing software code has to be made up in a completely open X uh, uh, strategy that means um, open open source, open APIs, open documentation, open access to that. Um, and so this is the way you can gain trust. Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot there that, that other countries and certainly the United States could, could learn from. I just have to say the, the gap, the relative gap in leadership between countries like Germany and I'd say Ireland and Switzerland and Singapore, other, other countries that are working hard on this, Austria, uh, the Nordics uh, and and the U.S. is is really striking. Uh, it's I think a extraordinarily low point in leadership for the U.S. It's just it, it is what it is. Uh, the good news I think is there are states who are, you know, uh, as we've seen governors and 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 state public health authorities that are working extraordinarily hard. And I I would say that I think we are really unfortunately at the very beginning of this question, which is that we don't, um, I think obviously we have a huge amount to learn from the history of public health uh, and the history of technology governance as as Louise and Thomas have, have pointed out about how to build trust. Uh, but I, I think the, the question of the trust dynamics in this pandemic, particularly with respect to these digital services, 
uh, we're at the very beginning of. Uh, and I, what we've seen in, in, in my lab, we spend a lot of time studying user trust behaviors in relation to, di to different kinds of mobile apps. And what we see is that, is that users make uh, instrumental decisions. They, uh, trust is not an absolute uh, quality. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a composite quality. It's who's the institution you're dealing with and what's the service you're getting? Is it, a, is it effective? Is it useful for you? Is it worth the trade-off? Um, and right now, I think it's fair to say that we just don't know. Um, uh, and I think a big part of the challenge for um, all public health authorities around the world who are interested in, in doing this is to make sure that, that um, they're open about the successes and failures of, of, of the way this, uh, the way the digital side of contact tracing uh, actually works. I think if people see that it has efficacy, they'll be much more likely to use it. And you can say that trans that, that means a higher level of trust or not. It, it doesn't really matter what you call it. But I think it's also clear on the other hand that if there's no evidence that this provides any value, it'll only be a curiosity for a, a small proportion of, of, of the citizens. So, so we're, we're, we're really at this, again, it would be great if we weren't at an early stage because it would mean the pandemic was closer to resolving, but it appears we're closer to the beginning or the middle uh, than the end. Um, and so along the way, I think we have this big challenge in, in being open and, and really uh, evaluating uh, how these, the digital side of these services are working uh, to encourage people to make the right, uh, the right decisions here. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, you know, I'd like to maybe sort of pull a little more on, on the thread uh, that Louise mentioned um, about the, the interplay between questions of trust and, and questions of equity. Um, and I think this maybe gets to some of the particular challenges that the United States has had that, that Dan, you were just discussing. Um, and we've, we've got a question here from Okeania um, about uh, the, the, both the role of the digital divide and, and maybe equity questions more generally and how we think about this challenge. Um, you know, there, there's sort of an obvious digital divide question. People who don't have smartphones really can't take part in the digital uh, side of, of contact tracing and are uh, therefore at even greater risk of, of becoming infected and, and not having the, the same protections that everyone else does. Um, another aspect of this, I think, is the, the social safety net in the United States being what it is. Um, you know, if, if you're someone who does not have paid sick leave, uh, you're not going to download an app uh, that might require you to take off time from work if, if supposing you, you may have been exposed. So I think this is maybe a question both to, to Louise and Danny, um, and I encourage either one of you to, to jump in, but you know, what, what can we do or, or how do we think about these sort of equity issues, um, you know, all, all of which break along uh, not just socioeconomic lines, but along uh, racial lines in the United States as well. Um, you know, what, is there a role for technology both to address these challenges or is, or is technology only exacerbating these challenges. I'm so happy that you raised that. So I'm going to jump in because I not my day job normally is really health equity. That's really the area that I normally um, work in in public health. And so I think there's lots to this. In addition, you know, the digital divide, you know, the elderly who may have older smartphones, the low vision folks who may have challenges with an app, um, health literacy, language ability, um, many aspects to the smartphone ownership piece. I do think though, though, if you have an integrated approach to your pandemic, you might argue that in the resources you save by people using an app who are able to use the app, you could ensure that you're addressing the more vulnerable members of your society, they're more affected members of your society through the other ways. You know, we, I do think that we have a challenge in public health where we're always kind of arguing with each other within public health. And this is because we are socialized for scarcity. In the US, public health has been completely defunded over time. So we a little bit, this happens in the global public health too. We argue one thing over the other when really we need both of things. So I think, the, again, to think of the promise 
is, of, of digital technology here is that it could supplement and add to um, the more traditional approaches. And if we try to think that one is going to supplant the other, I think we're in the wrong space of the argument. Um, you know, I, I think how to do that is a challenge from a technical perspective. Because on the technical side, again, the decentralized, the totally decentralized approach where it's hard for public health to actually know who was notified and you have to make some arrangements and, you know, to try to have the notified people contact public health is a little bit of a challenge to that. I don't know if there could have been, I would have hoped for a solution that was somewhere in between the totally centralized and the totally decentralized um, approach. But I do, you know, in general, all public health really should be done with an equity framework because what I know and what we know, you know, I gave a talk in early March that talked about all the things we knew were going to happen in the COVID pandemic in the United States, whether it was outbreaks for incarcerated people, communities of color, Native American populations, like we knew all of this was going to happen. And because we didn't have an equity framework, for our entire approach. And frankly, we just don't have an entire approach in the US. Um, we've seen the consequences of that. So I think equity is a really important thing to think about, but I do, you know, considering how overwhelming this pandemic is for so much of the world, I do, I would like to see how technology could, you know, be integrated in support and that we don't pit one against the other, because I think that's, that's a challenge. It, maybe just the last point, a number of my friends and colleagues at an organization called Partners in Health, where I spent a lot of my time in the past, are responsible for Massachusetts contact tracing initiative. And they have spoken a lot about how many people they call in contact tracing who really need support and who need to get, and they have whole members of their contact tracing team whose only job is to connect people to the social services they might need at a local level. So I think to get at your point, Sam, of the lack of a, sa a safety network in the US, there are options, but it's very complicated and it's very um, challenging to do. I've heard in Australia, uh, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, that if you have to be on quarantine, you get a, you get a stipend. It's just an automatic. You know, there are many approaches to it that unfortunately, again, the US has just been very, desegregated, um, you know, uncoordinated failure of leadership in our overall approach to the, to the outbreak. Thomas, I'm just curious for your perspective from, from Germany on that, have, how have you dealt with uh, both questions of, of equity in, in your response to the coronavirus pandemic and, and then separately but related, where have you seen the, the government's coronavirus response intersect with these kind of social policy questions and, and how have you gone about resolving uh, those issues? Yeah, as I already said, I, I think it's very important to have an open process on that. And I think the more you hide, the more curious the people get. And um, so this is what we tried from the beginning. Uh, we were very open up with bringing these scientists to the public and, and letting them speak instead of politicians. That was very helpful. And there were also different opinions on the scientists. But I think in, an, in a democratic society and with freedom of speech, that's no problem. But in the end, the direction of all these scientists went in, this, in, the, same, in the same direction. Uh, and, and therefore, I think this was very helpful. Uh, um, on getting trust on all these questions. And, um, and the second thing also is to make all the things that you're doing in your government um, um, openly and, and transparent. And that's what we did by developing the app, but that's what we also did on doing all the other decisions. And that was very important. We have uh, 16 uh, states in Germany and uh, a lot of decisions uh, for the lockdown uh, had to be made by the, by the regional governments. And um, so we made um, a platform where all the uh, uh, prime ministers of these regional states came together and we achieved that they uh, made uh, uh, common decisions. Um, in the end, right now, we have seen that there were differences, but uh, uh, in the hot phase of, of uh, COVID-19, 
uh, they came together, they discussed, and then they came out and said, so, okay, we together as the 16 prime ministers of the regional states, we have come to a common position, and here it is, and they, uh, they rolled it out, uh, everyone in uh, his own uh, uh, regional state, and I think this was also very important to see that. Also, there were in all these kinds of different opinions, and in, in Bavaria, they were more stronger and they were more pushing, and others said, so oh, aren't they maybe too fast on this lockdown and so on. But in the end, in the, in the, in the relevant phase, uh, all these guys came to, to common positions, and that was, I guess, very helpful. Could, could I just add uh, another point on the equity question? I, 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 I think um, Louise obviously. Um, has raised the most important set of questions about um, the way the pandemic response is is reflected through underlying social and economic uh, tensions and inequities that we have. Um, I think it's also important to consider the sense in which the protection that's offered by um, a whole variety of of, of digital contact tracing techniques and testing um, is going to be unequally distributed. Um, to begin with, uh, you know, we're all doing this from our homes where we do the sort of work that allows us to be at home. So a lot of this question is just not of immediate concern for us in a, in a certain way. Um, there are many people obviously because of their economic circumstances who don't have that choice. Um, I would also say that we're in touch with a number of employers, both uh, private uh, commercial employers and, and public institutions like universities that are, are making a whole series of localized decisions about the kinds of uh, um, digital contact tracing technologies that they will deploy in order to try to make their workplaces more safe, in order to try to protect uh, uh, their, their, their workers. And those are also uh, you know, resources that are gonna be um, distributed according to purely according to you know market mechanisms, not according to any kind of equity. We have no um, uh, in the U.S. We have not that I'm aware of yet gotten to a point where workers have any particular kind of guarantees of what a uh, you know a, a, a health safe, a COVID safe environment uh, actually is. But a lot of employers, those who have more resources, in particular. Are taking steps on their own, and I think, you know, in a very uh, American fashion, um, we're going to learn a lot from this very decentralized effort. We have, we'll have lots and lots of approaches that we will be able to study later. Uh, but in the meantime, to the extent that there's any protective uh, um, uh, um, benefit offered uh, by by these kinds of services, um, that's going to be even more unequally distributed, I would suggest, uh, than, than, than the, the public services are generally. And, and also I would say many, many employers may well be subject to a variety of kinds of privacy intrusions uh, because employers um, have pretty broad leeway at this point uh, to require their employees to provide all sorts of health information um, uh, there may be good reasons for that, but we are um, pretty pretty sorely lacking in in legal protections uh, for for that information. So, so we've we're we're discovering a whole we're rediscovering, I guess I should say, uh, through this through this crisis, a whole lot of weak points in our in our in our social fabric, and and hopefully we'll 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 learn from them going forward and fix them in a in a durable way. Thanks. So I, I want to try to pull in a couple more questions from our audience. Um, I mean, we've got one question from, from Eric Redmond that gets to uh, these sort of state by state uh, efforts to, to respond to the coronavirus in the United States. And, and obviously some of this is driven by a, a lack of, of leadership coming from the federal government. Um, but also as, as several of you mentioned earlier in your remarks, um, there is actually a, a sort of local and a regional uh, aspect to effective pandemic response. And so being able to respond on a, on a localized basis may make sense. I guess to, to bring the question back to the, to the app question, uh, and the question of these, these sort of digital applications, there are 
some states that have, have rolled out multiple apps by now and other states who have said that they're not planning to do so. Uh, and, and I think in most cases, uh, the, the efforts that various states are taking are not necessarily interoperable with each other. Um, and so I guess my question, and I think this probably goes uh, e either to, to, to Danny or Louise, but, but Thomas, you may have encountered similar sort of regional questions in, in Germany. What, what is the right level of, uh, of geographical area or, or human area that, that, that an app should cover? And, and how, uh, how do you balance the, the desire to have something that is globally interoperable, but also localizable? So uh, certainly uh, these apps uh, are being deployed uh, locally, that is either state by state uh, in the US or country by country in, in other parts of the world. Um, but they are all based on a, a common uh, protocol um, uh, from, from Apple and Google. So in principle, it is possible to exchange information about the infection status of individuals uh, in, in a privacy preserving way across jurisdictions. Um, uh, I think it's the right thing to do for, in the case of the US, for states to, to get their own uh, local systems uh, working first. Um, but because there's a kind of a common technical framework here, it is certainly possible for states to share um, uh, uh, the in information that would enable notification across state lines so that if, for example, someone travels uh, from Massachusetts to New York, um, and then later uh, tests positive, uh, it is certainly possible for the New York, uh, the individuals in New York to receive notifications um, uh, based on, on that Massachusetts individual status. And Thomas can speak more to this, but I know there were discussions at the EU level also about developing um, a kind of a federated da a database system which would enable the same kind of thing. I think everyone, we all want our economies to be able to return to normal as quickly as possible. And that entails uh, 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 quite a lot of travel. I think this is a second order question. Um, I don't think we should get hung up on it um, uh, because I think what the, where protection is most needed is locally. People spend most of their lives locally. Um, but we certainly, I think it, it certainly is possible to add this um, uh, because there's a common protocol underneath the whole system. Yes, I, th I think it's it's necessary to be interoperable with these applications. And um, saying this, uh, I know it's a huge challenge, especially when you look all over Europe. There are some countries that follow our approach of having a decentralized solution. Other countries have a centralized solution. And bring this together uh, is obvious a technical problem. It's it's solvable, but uh, not in this uh, uh, short amount of time that that we have to, to start here with this app and um, when we started uh, our idea was to have a pep pt it was called uh, a technology that can be used all over europe in the end this uh, approach didn't succeed right now we have these apis from uh, google and from apple and they make the standard and also these APIs, they, they um, do the technical stuff, the technical stuff in terms of how far are other Bluetooth devices away uh, and how to be interoperable. This was a question between the Android phones and, and the Apple phones. And uh, uh, so what Google and Apple are implementing there on, on uh, operating system level uh, seems to work more or less. And uh, I guess as with every kind of technology and, and software code, um, they're starting and now it has to be improved. There are still some bugs, but in general it works. Um, our approach is that if you stay for some period in a spe specific distance of one and a half meter um, uh, right next to an infected person, then you get a warning message. If you only met for a short period of time or for a more far distance, then you're not going to be alerted. And so there's an algorithm that's going to learn. Um, and uh, we also will find out if these, these warning messages of the app uh, um, are correlating also with true infections. And so this is something where you can, again, voluntarily share your data. 
uh, and that helps for the development and for the better understanding how the virus spreads and, and so on. But interoperability is, is important and so that's what we're trying to achieve. There is dialogue on European level to find a better uh, standards between uh, the apps of these countries because even if people are only acting local or regional, uh, if you're right next to the borders of the other countries, then there are a lot working uh, in, the, in, the, in the other country and traveling every day over the border and therefore you need solutions right now. They have to install more than one app to be present on both systems and I don't think this is the future approach. But uh, in this short period of time, I think we achieved not that bad and uh, for these kind of improvements, I think this is going to be added. Thanks, Thomas. So, so we're getting near the top of the hour. Um, I think we probably could have gone on for another hour. Uh, we've got, unfortunately, a lot of questions that we didn't get to, and I've, I've got uh, things that I'd, I'd still love to discuss. But um, with just a few minutes left, um, I'd maybe like to give each of you the, the chance to, to briefly uh, touch on, on any last uh, items or ideas that, that we, didn't, we didn't get to in this hour that, that you would like to to leave our audience with as, as a final message. Um, so, so Louise, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, and please, if you have sort of any, any, any last words or any last thoughts, uh, love to hear them. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think the key messages for me are that no one piece of pandemic response is the panacea. We have to have integrated comprehensive approaches. We have to have an equity mindset so that we think about the things and the people we're leaving out. I think we have still a lot to learn about the technology apps. How well does the sensor work? How useful are the apps? How much they can contribute to our controlling the pandemic, containing it? How much do, can we use them to help on the social services side? But I will also say that this is not the only pandemic that we will have in this world. And we should always be thinking as well about how we're refining ourselves for either the next wave or the next pandemic that might come across us. So I think there's um, a lot of possibility here and uh, I definitely am looking forward to seeing how, uh, how we learn and how this evolves. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Thomas, any, any parting thoughts? I can only say stay healthy. <laughs> Always good advice. Danny, Danny, we'll give you the final word, and, and optimism is, is always welcome. So um, the fascinating thing about this process is the underlying protocol that we've been talking about was designed in about three weeks um, and then deployed globally by Apple and Google in a very short period of time. Now we have the hard part, which is we have to understand, I think, the critical question we've been talking about, which is this trust efficacy dynamic. We're asking people to... Um, give up some of their time, give up some of their personal information uh, for the public good and for their own good. And we've learned, I think, I think it's extraordinary in this pandemic that so many people around the world have engaged in self-sacrificing and public spirited behavior. And they've done it because there was a clear case made to them. And it's obviously we could have saved many more lives, but we've probably saved hundreds of thousands of lives because of people's public uh, community mindedness. And I think the challenge now is, um, is for the technology community and the public health community to stay engaged uh, with the public and, and understand how to make this work better and better. Um, no, no app, no information services works perfectly the first time. It only works well because it gets tuned based on how people use it and what people's experience is. So, um, uh, you know, I think, I think there's been an extraordinary coming together from, from governments, from academics, from uh, public health community, many of whom we in the technical world never knew uh, before, and, and I think will benefit from that uh, in the long run, as long as we stay focused on those, those important goals. Great. Well, I think that's a, a perfect message to end on. Louise, Danny, Thomas, thank you all so much. Thanks to our audience for tuning in and uh, look forward to staying in touch with everyone. And I'll, I'll echo Thomas's uh, exhortation to stay healthy, everyone. Thanks all. Thank you.